How do we stand firm against those aspects attempting to corrupt our faith? Well, Jesus gave us a very good example. He spent more time with God than he spent with people. Hmm. In prayer, talking to God. So, of course, he gave us quite a few other examples as well, but that is a primary one. He spent more time with God, and that kept his heart and mind straight. So, let's move on to Wednesday's lesson. Here we go. Wednesday's lesson. Now we're dealing with reason. Let's take just a short break and make sure that we are uh, operating still with the camera and all. All right, I'm going to check the time and uh, get a little drink of water. So let's read 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 5 and 6 as we get into the very beginning of Wednesday's lesson. Uh, we're also going to be reading Proverbs 1, 7 and Proverbs 9, 10. That's chapter 9, verse 10. And this is the question it's asking us. Why is obedience to Christ in our thoughts so important? Why is the fear of the Lord the beginning of wisdom? Good question. Let's read those passages. 2 Corinthians is our first one. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And we are ready to punish all disobedience whenever your, disobedient, whenever your obedience is complete. Hmm. That's a curious statement. Proverbs 1.7 The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. And Proverbs 9.10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Well, I'm sure you have some answers of your own for that question. Mine would be, if I were to hold my knowledge up, my wisdom up, and make that the standard against which I measure everything else, I have made myself God, in a sense. I have given myself the ability to be the standard against which I measure other things. I'm just a human. If I believe God is who he says he is, and I do, why in the world would I set myself up as a standard to measure against in even wisdom or, or you know, intelligence or whatever you want to call it? Why would I do that if I believe God is who he is? And I do. Couldn't do that. Well, God has given us the ability to think and to reason. He gave us brains, after all. Every human activity and every theological argument assumes our ability to think and to draw conclusions. We don't endorse an unreasonable faith. In the wake of the 18th century Age of Enlightenment, however, human reason assumed a new and dominant role especially in Western society, that goes far beyond our ability to think and to arrive at correct inclusions. conclusions. In contrast to the idea that all our knowledge is based on sensory experience, another view regards human reason as the chief source of knowledge. This view is called rationalism. It's the idea that truth is not sensory, but intellectual and is derived from reason. In other words, from our ability to think about how something works, and then we derive truth from that. <laughs> I, I have to chuckle, because here we are operating in this world, and every day we are finding out new things about it. If you follow any of the science with quantum mechanics, uh, with quantum entanglement, we've talked briefly about that at times, Einstein referred to it as the spooky action at a distance. That means that there is a particle that has become 
quantumly entangled with another particle, no matter how far apart they are, that when something happens to this particle, the exact same thing happens to the particle that is entangled. Now, the math says that it does not matter how far apart these particles are, it still takes place. The equations behind this theory. In fact, it's been proven now, uh, scientists have actively proven that this really does happen. We assume it happens at much farther distances than it does because the math supports that. Imagine that happening if there, a particle somehow became quantumly entangled here on Earth to a part of, particle that was, uh, mm, let's say, out in the Andromeda galaxy. That means that somehow there is a speed that is faster than light, and we don't know anything about it. And yet, humanity wants to set themselves up as a standard uh, and against which we measure wisdom. Hmm? And we don't even know everything about the natural world in which we live in. So that's why I had to chuckle just a little bit. You know, reason became the new authority before which everything else had to bow, including the authority of the church, and more dramatically, even the authority of the Bible as God's word. Everything that was not self-evident to human reason was discarded, its legitimacy questioned. This attitude affected large parts of Scripture. All miracles and supernatural acts of God, such as the bodily resurrection of Jesus, the virgin birth, or the six-day creation, to name just a few, those were no longer considered trustworthy or true. Incredible. The truth is, we should remember the fact that even our reasoning power is affected by sin and needs to be brought under the reign of Christ. We are living in a sinful world. If you believe that... Hmm, how best to word that? If you believe that sin is here and that it affects creation and that creation is not the way it was intended to be, okay? Sin has damaged the way creation was supposed to happen. If you believe that, why in the world would you believe that our minds are capable of determining what is true and what is not true just by our own wisdom? when it comes to the Word of God. doesn't make any sense. Excuse me. Hmm. Human beings are darkened in their understanding and alienated from God. We need to be enlightened by God's Word. Furthermore, the fact that God is our Creator indicates, at least biblically speaking, that our human reason is not created as something that functions independently or autonomously of God. Rather, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It is only when we accept God's revelation embodied in the written word of God as supreme in our lives and are willing to follow what is written in the Bible that we can reason correctly. I know that's a big statement, but if God is our creator, if he created us, he created us with the ability to reason, the ability to think through things, don't you think that he knows the best way to help that happen. So, the fear of the Lord would be the beginning of wisdom. Learning to know that God is who he says he is. I see that as being perfectly acceptable to say that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You know, let's read that little blurb at the end of Wednesday's lesson. Centuries ago, American President Thomas Jefferson made his own version of the New Testament. Perhaps you weren't aware of that. Perhaps you were. He did this by cutting out anything that, in his view, went against reason. Gone were almost all the miracles of Jesus, including his resurrection. What should this alone teach us about the limits of human reason for understanding truth? And I'll let you answer that question, but for me, the answer is quite simple. Uh, perhaps it has a lot of facets to it, but the main thing being, how could we, a creation, possibly hope to judge the Creator? I just, I don't see any possible way that ends uh, with us being right, or accurate, or wise, 
a creation being better than the creator. Let's move on to Thursday's lesson. And now we deal with the Bible. The Holy Spirit, who has revealed and inspired the content of the Bible to human beings, will never lead us contrary to God's Word or astray from the Word of God. For Seventh-day Adventists, the Bible has a higher authority than human tradition, than human experience, than human reason, or human culture. The Bible alone is the norm by which everything else needs to be tested. We talked about the standards, right? Remember? Yeah. Okay. So we're going to read John chapter 5, verse 46 and 47, and John 7, 38. And we're going to think about this question here as we read those passages. For Jesus Christ, the Bible is the ultimate source for understanding spiritual matters. How does the Bible confirm that Jesus is the true Messiah? Well, John for if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my word? I think Jesus is giving a word of caution here. Uh, if we can't pick and choose what we determine to be true, we don't literally don't have the ability to judge what is true and what is not true in God's word. That was given to us by God, if you believe that, and I do. Therefore, I believe I do not have the ability to judge what I should leave in the Bible and what I should ignore. I believe all of Scripture is very important to human understanding. How about John 30, 730, 738? He who believes in me, as the Scripture said, from his innermost being will flow Rivers of living water. Wow. That's just a fantastic promise. He who believes in me, as the scripture said. Wow. Huh. That's incredible. Well, the Bible is very clear that Jesus is the true Messiah. Some people claim to have received special revelations and instructions from the Holy Spirit but some of these claims clearly go against the message of the Bible. For them, the Holy Spirit has attained a higher authority than God's Word. Whoever nullifies the written and inspired Word of God and evades its clear message is walking on dangerous ground and is not following the leading of God's Spirit. God's Spirit is the one who originally impressed the holy men of God to write the Scriptures. If he did that and then came later on and impressed more people to say something that went against the Word of God, well, that wouldn't make any sense at all. So we have to be careful to judge the things that we hear, even when someone claims to be speaking from the Holy Spirit. We have to judge that against the written Word of God, which we know to be the living Word of God. Just saying. Whoever nullifies the written and inspired word of God and evades its clear message is walking on dangerous ground and is not following the leading of God's Spirit. I think I just read that. The Bible is our only spiritual safeguard. It alone is a reliable norm for all matters of faith and practice. Amen. Through the scriptures, the Holy Spirit speaks to the mind and impresses truth upon the heart. Thus, he exposes error and expels it from the soul. It is by the Spirit of truth, working through the Word of God, that Christ subdues his chosen people to himself. Hmm. The Holy Spirit should never be understood to replace the Word of God. Never. Rather, he works in harmony with and through the Bible to draw us to Christ. So the Holy Spirit is always working with the Scriptures, in harmony with the Bible, to draw people closer to God. Never to be divisive or to separate people from the Bible, from the Word of God. The Holy Spirit does not do that. Hmm. The Bible provides sound doctrine, and as God's Word is trustworthy, trustworthy and deserves full acceptance. It is not our task to sit in judgment 
over Scripture, nor do we even have truly have the capacity to do so. We may think we do, and many people, in fact, do sit in judgment over the Scripture. But how? How can they honestly believe that what they're doing is right when we, again, are the creation and God is the creator who gave us the scriptures? Hmm. You know, the word of God, rather, has the right and authority to judge us and our thinking. After all, it was the written word of God given by God himself. <laughs> so... I think we don't have to jump too far to get to that one. Let's read this last little blurb on Thursday's lesson. Why is the Bible a safer guide in spiritual questions than our subjective impressions? Well, for one, we can be deceived. Our experiences, you know, we can be deceived in those experiences. Our emotions can be clouded. And our actions, well, can come from those clouded emotions. All right. What are the consequences when we do not accept the Bible as a standard by which we test all teachings and even our spiritual experience? Clearly, we can be led astray. If private revelation were the final word in spiritual questions, why would this lead to nothing but chaos and error? Well, private revelation... Hmm. If that were the only measure... I'm sorry, if that were the, the final word in spiritual questions, well, anyone could say whatever they wanted. And how would you dispute them? Because they could say, the Holy Spirit told me. How would you know how to dispute what they were saying? You would have to accept it as, well, being the word of God. Until someone else came along and said, well, the Holy Spirit told me this, and it's different from that. And someone else might come up and say, well, the Holy Spirit told me this, and it's different from that and that. Chaos, right? Of course, chaos and error. And here we find ourselves on Friday's lesson. I want to read a passage. I'm sorry, a passage from Friday here. It says, Tradition, experience, culture, reason, and the Bible, all of those things we just studied this week, are present in all our reflection on the Word of God. But we need to ask a decisive question. Which of these sources has the final say and the ultimate authority in our theology? That's a question you need to ask yourself personally. Which of these sources has the final authority in your life and in your theology? It's one thing to affirm the Bible, but it is something else altogether to allow the Bible, through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, to impact our life and our decisions, our minds, in one sense, culture, experience, reason, and even tradition in and of themselves might not of necessity be bad, but they become problems when they contradict what Scripture teaches. We spoke about that. But that is often to be expected, of course. It would be a problem. What's worse, however, is when these things take precedence over the Word of God, when we give them more importance than the Word of God. Clearly, we end up with something wrong in our lives if we have given um, what were they calling the uh, culture, experience, reason, or tradition? When we have assigned importance to those things that make them rise over and above the Word of God. Okay? So much of history of apostasy in both Old and New Testament kind, times come when outside influences took precedence over divine revelation. Wow. We're going to read through these discussion questions, which I hope you will find time to discuss with your neighbors, with your friends on Facebook, with your friends through text message, through Zoom video, however you decide to do it. I hope you take some time to discuss these questions. Question one, why is it easier to uphold details of some human traditions than to live the spirit of God's law? Why is it easier to love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, and soul? Wait, let me read that one more time. <laughs> Scratch what I just read. Why is it easier to uphold details of some human traditions than to live the spirit of God's law? 
to love the Lord our God with all our heart and soul and mind and our neighbor as ourself. That is the spirit of God's law. Why is it easier to uphold human traditions? Well, because, <laughs> never mind, I've got long answers there, but we need to hurry and get to our story and wrap this lesson study up because our worship service is just around the corner. Question two. In class, discuss your answer to Sunday's final question, which was, what role should tradition play in our church? Where do you see blessings and challenges in religious traditions? My, oh my. That is a heavily weighted question. I hope you take some time to answer that. Even if you don't discuss it with others, I hope you do. But please take some time to think about that and answer it for yourself. Question three. How can we make sure that tradition, no matter how good it may be, does not supersede the written word of God as our final norm and authority? Well, one of those ways is for us to be very honest with ourselves when we examine the traditions in our church, in our lives, in our personal theology. We must be honest with ourselves when we do this. Question four. Suppose someone claims to have had a dream in which the Lord spoke to him or her, telling him or her that Sunday is the true day of rest and worship for New Testament times. How would you respond to that person? What does a story like this teach us about how experience must always be tested by the Word of God? Hmm, there's some good answers to that one, too. Question five. In class. Well, sorry, we're not going to be able to do that. Talk about the culture in which your church finds itself immersed. How does that culture impact your faith? What examples can we find from history in which culture greatly impacted the actions of church members in a way that, looking back now, we see as negative? And what lessons can we take from this for ourselves today so that we don't make similar mistakes? Hmm. It's good not to forget our mistakes. Not to dwell on them so that they drag us down, but we also don't want to repeat them again and again and again and again. All right, so we have a story entitled, this is the story that's found at the end of each lesson. This is at the end of lesson four, second quarter. It's called The Inside Story. The title of our story today is called Surprise Package in Finland. Six-year-old Timo Flink looked with awe at a picture of Jesus' second coming in Arthur Maxwell's The Bible Story. How many of you remember those? I do. Unable to read, he stared at Jesus sitting on a cloud of angels. I want to be up with the angels, Flink thought. As a young adult, he wanted to serve God, but became distracted with computers. As he studied to become a software engineer, he joined a group of young adults who discussed the Bible every Friday evening with a pastor. Soon, the group became embroiled in a debate about infant baptism. Flink's church practiced infant baptism, but several young people in the group belonged to another Sunday church that baptized by immersion. Flink was surprised that his pastor defended infant baptism, but couldn't support the practice biblically. At that time, Flink joined a Revelation study group. He sensed that the book was important, but he couldn't understand it. He prayed for understanding. At the height of his confusion, he visited his parents during spring break. Sitting down to eat, he was surprised to see a book. His father didn't read much, and he wondered why he had the book. What's this, he asked. Well, the postman delivered it yesterday, his father said. It's from a distant relative. Flink took a closer look at the book. Its title was The Great Controversy. And in smaller text, he read the words, Ancient prophecies are coming true. At that moment, he remembered the picture of Jesus' second coming from his childhood. Three days later, he'd finished the book. Wow, that guy can read. All right. It answered all his questions about revelation and infant baptism. This is what I've been looking for, he thought. Flink read the book again that summer and a third time in the fall. Then he saw a newspaper advertisement for a Daniel seminar at the Adventist church. He had read about Adventists in the Great Controversy, and he went. He was baptized. An article about his baptism subsequently appeared in a church magazine, which publishes announcements about all baptisms. Across Finland, the distant relative who had mailed the book rejoiced at the news. Wow. 
Fantastic. Well, y'all, I hope you have enjoyed the lesson study. I know this isn't exactly some back and forth. I would much rather have interaction with you, especially with this study. Perhaps once we're all back together, we can go back over this study and talk about it some more in uh, face to face rather than just over a video. May God bless you. Thank you so much for spending your time with me this morning or whenever you listen to this. Thank you for spending your time with me. And I hope to see you again next week, even if it is on video only. May God bless you.